Siberia today is over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a huge, flashing, bright red sign. And one of the top climate scientists in the world, Professor Michael Mann, drops by to discuss it. Check it out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. So the uh, northern Russian Siberian town of Verkhoyansk, which is uh, normally in the dead of summer, you know, hits an average high temperature of around 68 degrees, is uh, over 100 degrees, or at least it was yesterday, I'm not sure about today. Uh, this is very troubling, or at least it seems to be on the surface. Let's do a reality check here with Dr. Michael Mann, the Distinguished Professor of Meteorology, the Director of the Earth Systems Science Center at Penn State University, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, author of several books, including most recently The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. He's also the recipient of the Tyler Prize. His website, Michael Mann, with two N's at the end, uh, net, and you can tweet him at Michael E. Mann, M-A-N-N. -N. Uh, Dr. Mann, Professor Mann, uh, welcome back to the program. What uh, should we... I, I mean, is this like a flare going off, uh, you know, a, a, a warning? Uh, you know, and I guess that's... Uh, that uh, metaphor is almost a pun, but is it? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. It's good to be with you. Um, well, you know, this is just the latest uh, development that really drives home the fact that we are dealing with what can reasonably be described as a planetary emergency. Uh, we are seeing new thresholds of, of warmth, uh, of heat. Um, here in the United States, now in the Arctic, um, the Arctic is warming about twice the rate uh, of the rest of the planet. And that has to do with some of the, the factors that are specific to that region. Um, there's a, a lot of ice, and when you melt that ice away and you expose the uh, ocean surface or the ground, it can heat up m much uh, more rapidly. And so we see that so-called Arctic amplification of warming at work. In fact, the Arctic has warmed the better part of uh, a degree Fahrenheit over the past century, as much as the rest of the planet has warmed over several decades, um, just in one decade. That's how fast the planet is warming. And so we expect to see these new thresholds breached. And this is a significant one, 100 degrees, triple digits uh, Fahrenheit um, temperatures in, in the Arctic, north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, it is simply consistent with the picture that is emerging of a planet that's warming up and, and a climate that is changing in adverse ways as we continue to pump carbon pollution into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. We have been uh, warned by the uh, IPCC that, uh, we, uh, in fact, it was, what, two, three years ago that they said you've got 10 years to get this thing under control. Um, does this this uh, you know revelation of this this rapid warming in the Arctic um, does this mean that their timeline was too conservative that you know the the crisis is even closer to us than we thought or does this validate their assertion and and how is the world responding to this yeah so no this is more or less consistent with the predictions uh, when you warm the planet even by a degree you increase the likelihood of those extreme heat events like the ones we're seeing in the Arctic uh, by tenfold or a hundredfold. It just has to do with the fact that the extreme events become even more extreme, even with a, a modest amount of warming. And of course, we'll see much more warming if we continue on this course. So the fact that what is happening, uh, what is unfolding is consistent with the model predictions is cause enough for concern. Um, it indicates that, in fact, we don't have much time. If we are to limit warming uh, below truly catastrophic levels, um, you mentioned a decade. Uh, it was the 12-year uh, sort of number that was quoted quite a bit uh, a couple oh, of years, years ago. That we had 12 yeah. years. Yeah. And so it's, it's about two years later. So that's about 10 years. And, and what that number really means is that we have about a decade to bring down those carbon emissions dramatically by a factor of two, even within the next decade, if we're to avert warming the planet by more than about two degrees, the better part of four degrees uh, Fahrenheit, where we really start to see the worst impacts play out. Um, so we don't have much time. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis 
Uh, ironically, the shutdown um, and the decrease in air travel and transportation, um, that led only to a modest decrease in carbon emissions. Uh, it looks like maybe only about 4%, uh, or, or no more than 7% this year, even with that massive shutdown, that massive uh, lockdown. Uh, and, you know, that isn't even enough. If we're to bring those carbon emissions down by a factor of two in the next decade, we've got to bring them down by more than 10% every year. And so that shows that this is still an uphill battle. Um, simply changing individual behavior, traveling less, um, uh, those sorts of uh, you know, changes in, 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 in behavior and, and individual action aren't enough. We need what we you know, ultimately need um, are systemic changes, structural changes in our economy, policies that incentivize a massive and rapid shift away from fossil fuel burning. For example... What what might those oh, policies uh, what, look like? What what you know, where, where would you suggest you know policymakers start? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know the Green New Deal. Um, I actually think it doesn't quite mm -hmm. go far enough. Uh, the Green New Deal contains incentives for renewable energy, which is a critical part of the solution. I also think we actually need to put a price on carbon. Polluters need to pay when they dump their pollution into the atmosphere. Right now, they do that at no cost. As my good friend Bill Kibben has said, we've given the fossil fuel industry the greatest. Uh, subsidy of all time. They can dump their waste into our atmosphere at no cost, and that has to change. And so, you know, there is um, reason to believe that if we see, you know, this massive blue wave that is shaping up right now, and we see new leadership in Washington, D.C., we can hit the ground running. We're making some progress already, even under Trump. There's enough happening at the state level and what companies are doing, what individuals are doing, um, that we're making some progress what we need to do is accelerate that progress. And, you know, if we get a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, uh, maybe even working together with some moderate conservatives who are, you know, offended by what their party has become, I think there's a real opportunity uh, for dramatic action here within the next year. One of the things that, uh, that we're seeing in uh, governments around the world is the shift to the authoritarian right. Uh, you know, we're seeing it right here at home with Donald Trump in the White House. Uh, and hopefully it'll be a temporary one, but more permanent ones have happened in Turkey, in the Philippines, in India now with Mr. Modi, uh, in Hungary with uh, uh, Orban, in uh, uh, Poland with Duda, in uh, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. And one of the through lines for all of these seems to be climate change denial. Now, you wrote a book about, uh, you know, the Madhouse Effect, about climate change denial and its relationship uh, to politics and to billionaires and all this kind yeah. of stuff. Um, what, I, you know, I look at this scenario and I'm just like flummoxed. Why do, why do the world's billionaires want to fund right-wing governments to deny climate science? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sad commentary on our state of affairs, Tom, and, and you speak to a much larger problem. Climate change denial and, 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 and the lack of action on climate is really a symptom of a much larger problem that we have right now um, with authoritarian, authoritarian regimes uh, taking hold uh, around the world. And one commonality here is fossil fuels. Uh, most of these countries we're talking about are essentially petrostates. Um, their governmental policies are dictated by powerful fossil fuel interests who have their own short-term financial interest, um, you know, uh, uh, favor their, their own short-term financial interest over the, the greater good of, of the people that these um, governments are supposed to represent. So it's a disturbing trend. I, I like to think that uh, when we have a chance to reverse that trend here in November in the United States, and perhaps that will mark sort of the so-called lancing of the boil, where we finally see the breaking of this uh, bubble and maybe a return 